when you were a child, mm-hmm. right? Uh, when did you know that you would want to be an artist? Actually, I'm one of the I'm one of those that want want to be artist from from young. So in a way, it wasn't very accidental. I I draw a lot when I was a kid. It's the conventional. I I drew a lot then. Um, join art competitions, and I uh, went to. I studied in Sota first, uh, so that was when I was thirteen, and didn't really change my mind. Uh, but interestingly, when when I join art competitions, they ask you like what you want to do when you grow up. Then my dad would tell me like don't. It's a bit strange if you say you want to be an artist and then you're drawing about you being an artist. Uh. So I always drew astronaut. Uh. Okay. <laughs> Why, why astronaut? Astronaut? I think it was partly my dad's idea. La. Like oh, as a, no, I think visually he thought it would be quite nice like, if you draw astronaut. Then you have like the space, you have space and spaceship behind. It's quite nice. So I remember joining astronaut competition and the question is what you want to be when you grow up. So, the, so I drew astronaut. Which was your dad's? Yeah, I didn't want to be astronaut. Yeah. No, it wasn't his dream. He just thought it was a, it was a, the correct answer to the question, <laughs> in, in a very Singaporean way. I think, calculating, calculating, how you would succeed in this art competition. But I didn't win anything. Yeah. It looks like your your parents, or at least your dad, had a plan for you. What what do your parents do? Um. My dad is semi-retired. He makes a car curtain, so the curtain for cars. Uh, my mom has been housewife. Uh, previously, my dad did business in machinery. Yeah. Uh, but oh. very much self-employed. Huh? Both of them. Yeah. So they they are like independent uh, business people. Uh, actually, very not businessy. Huh? So their plan in life was to retire early but to be very, very, very thrifty and don't buy a lot of things. Mm. Um, so they, they really are the most anti-consumerist people I know. Uh, that kind of rubs off uh, on you in terms of your relationship to objects and things, right? Mm, it does. I realized it re- more recently also. Uh, I mean, when we are talking about uh, People in the arts being quite resistant to resistant to con- consumerism, capitalism. But I think my parents were the most, um, were the biggest uh, influence for me in in having those thoughts uh, about about um, different ways of living. Uh. So their strategy was very simple. If you don't, if you don't want to, they they wanted more time uh, to spend time with the kids. Then, um, and the solution was. If you have, if you want more time, and then you don't want to be working a lot, then you just don't spend money. So they had kind of a quite. Uh, for me, it's quite radical. And this this way is something that I'm trying to live with now. I mean, as as an artist trying to work less less hours, but also um, and have more time. But the solution, the thing that has to give way is you give up certain. Um, spending habits. So, in this um, saving of um, money to create more time, um, what are some of the things that are basic that must be there for existence? Actually, I reached a point in my life where I have enough things. Uh, I I have guitars, uh, I have mu- enough music equipment, so when you're into music, there's a lot of gear involved. I think the same with, I guess, photography or things like that. Um, the essential things that I need, I already spent on food and, food and transport. Uh. Yeah, that's a lot of it. So you said you are anti-consumerist in that you don't buy anything that is unnecessary. Um, that reminds me of something I read that you actually lost a camera, a good camera. How did that happen? Uh, so it was the last day of school, I remember. Then we had just finished exams. 
and I was graduating from SOTA already. Then I left my camera inside a cupboard in the classroom, thinking that the next day I will come and collect it. And then there was my friend's camera, and then my camera was there, and then mine was gone, so I knew it was stolen. Um, yeah, so we were talking also about uh, after the camera was stolen, then it, it did have a shift in my practice because I realized I don't I don't actually need the cam the DSLR anymore and my life was much better with, without the the camera. Um and then I started moving into more found found images and uh using uh smaller cameras and eventually for, for this work is my iPhone camera. Yeah. Okay. So um the loss of that camera marked the shift from um, a more traditional relationship with photography to something a bit more, uh, let's say, open to using, making images without the camera, is that right? Mm, I think also because um, I was quite familiar with uh, photography, so so I was in the photography crew doing event photography for for school and then in army I, I joined the SAF film unit being a event photographer for the chief defense force so my goal my, my job was to capture all the handshakes huh? and so so I was I, I was quite comfortable with uh, event photography and working at DSL uh, and then subsequently working at, at DEC um, uh, I was exposed to again quite high production level uh, photography blown up, um, big scale, and was familiar with printing. Um, and, and after that, I think I, I wanted to do something uh, different with, with photography. And it started to shift. It tends to shift um, towards uh, kind of amateurism. So maybe we can talk a bit about um, the use of found photography. Um, some of these come, would come from newspapers, is that right? Yeah, so uh, a work that that is lasting quite long um, for me is, is a series of newspaper paintings where I uh, wiped out um, quite significant portion of the newspaper so that only images stay there. Um, that Working with the newspaper started when I um, I wanted to eliminate completely using the computer actually. So so before that I was working with screenshots uh, from YouTube and Google Images. Still involved some form of printing and using the computer. But um, then I realized that I already found uh, and printed images. So uh, I began to um, sort of recycle the images uh, with, and recycle the, the newspaper. Um, Mm. Yeah, I really like the um, newspaper, white printed newspaper series and even when you move into that book project huh, where you would um, lay out really small iPhone images, um, the expense of generosity of space is, is there as well, right? Mm. Uh... Yeah, so slowly, more more recently, the, there's been a... I try to figure out like a kind of visual language that um, has been built up. Uh, and very, very accidentally, it has happened to be kind of images that are smaller or, and, and um, kind of floating around in, in space. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why also, but I guess that's the kind of visual language that I'm comfortable with. Um, so it, it, it started with working with large um, photo series where, where usually you um, place them in a grid on the wall and usually quite minimalist um, but yet there, there's a lot of repetition then, then slowly I think uh, pushing again for more natural and more um, also maybe messy and amateurish then, then yeah, it's, it's slowly formed into this 
I became quite comfortable with um, having disjointed images floating around in space. Mm. So this, this actually um, reminds me of the photographs that you have pasted on the cardboard lamps. Um, because they look like um, windows, lit windows in buildings. Um, is that what you are thinking about as well? Like Mm. photos as windows into spaces. I, I haven't really made the connection uh, so much, but, but that the windows were really quite a, uh, I think a subconscious starting point uh, for, the, for the work. Because the work developed really during, during the circuit breaker period where, where we all uh, stayed in for, for that, um, that two, three weeks I think was the crucial point where I was vigorously making the work and thinking about the work uh, and I was staring a lot at the window at the windows across from, from my block uh, whether it's kind of interior space, I think it does make sense because the images were I chose kind of images that I, I liked in, intuitively and from quite a personal source as from my phone uh, I didn't intend for them to become part of the work uh, they were just taken on on a regular basis uh, over the past two maybe two years before I cleared my phone before I kind of import everything up. Um, so yeah, they are kind of actually also interiors or quite personal interiors. Mm. Okay. So talk about um, why you propose to make this show um, for Commerce Space. Why I propose to make this particular show? Yeah. Uh, I think definitely Coma has um, because I saw quite a few of the shows before that also. I I knew that I uh, I was free to experiment. So actually, the initial plan was to show the newspaper paintings, which I guess were uh, is a work that I'm more confident with, uh, and also a work that I want to identify with, um, but, but slowly it shifted to, um, I guess as, as I saw more of the shows, then I became very much more comfortable with uh, showing, with trying something new. Um, also, I guess with the pandemic, then, then there was, uh, I really thought very hard that it, it cannot be a show that does not deal with, with the with the situation now, or is kind of tone deaf to, to the situation and kind of just um, continuing on with, with what has been going on or what I have been working on. It, it has to shift because of this dramatic shift. Now. So this uh, exhibition, Cardboard, Lambs and Adequate Images, um, the title literally describes what we see. Right, the the lamps and their images. Um, but I understand it's also about your relationship to home. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so the the work that I proposed midway through uh, speaking to Rob Ping was was actually a work that uh, would evolve from the cardboard boxes that I would I use for moving house. So I moved. I moved in in March, uh, both studio and home, um, and I was left with a lot of cardboard box. And coincidentally, I was also working a job in in a warehouse, uh, dealing mostly with with boxes. So the materials became. I I would say I, I was quite proficient uh, with boxes and taping. Uh, making sure the lines are straight, then you don't have bubbles and overlays. So I was actually very proficient in it. Um, and so I have to use like a, I thought I use a technique that I'm proficient with to, to make my work also. Um, the, the moving boxes were huge. So I, for a while I was trying to make a, a sculpture with, with the moving boxes, but they were just too big to move around a messy half unpacked house. So that kind of weighed me down for, for quite a while um, until I decided, okay, I'll use smaller 
boxes that I collect from um, the shop below my house that sells kind of hardware and everything. Mm. So that was the relation to home. Um, is also, I guess, quite a positive and warm work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, which I guess is is my my reflection of having quite a, a relatively good past three years uh, staying with my partner. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So, um, of all the um, things that could be found at home, like furniture and small objects like crockery and utensils, you have chosen light. Can you share a bit about that? That's why I'm still trying to trace how the lights started up. Um, so there, there are a few uh, reference points. Um, very early on, actually be, before the circuit breaker, I had a conversation with a friend about uh, what kind of art we should be making at at this point of time, and and also like what, whether there's a point in making art or whether we should be talking about art. Then, then he said something about how it's actually more important because art can give some form of hope. Um, but um, I mean, if we, if we, of from my perspective as a quite quite a cynical person, it, it can sound a, a bit um, cliche or <laughs> difficult to understand. But but I really. Because of that, I really thought, okay, actually I should make a, a hopeful work or to think about what kind of work you want someone to enter post, um, post lockdown and when things get better. Um, and uh, I decided it would, I wanted someone, I wanted some form of warmth and um, homeliness in the work that I present. Uh, another, other random points are um, a work by Trevor Young, um, which is this mushrooms in in um, power sockets coming out of power sockets they are lit up um, and also testing out um, making a DIY light box uh, which I think I was trying out during the time so these things kind of came came together to um, come out with the lamps uh. actually the, the material cardboard is something um, that you have used before uh, in another show, right, to create a, a sink uh, with dishes, um, and yeah, I was following quite a number of uh, your series that revolves around um, living at home. Um, you know the the series, the the book about um, dishes that are to be washed. Uh, but you would take a photograph and then um, draw the dishes as forms of still life. That's really interesting. Um, so coming back to light, do you think that it's also because um, of the way you are now renting rather than uh, rather than owning where you stay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So we we had a problem of buying too many lamps. Every time we we would keep thinking that we need another lamp, um, because because we cannot install built-in lights. Uh. So if we want to change the lighting, we would buy lamps. So at a point we had so so many lamps everywhere, and we were kind of addicted to like this uh, creating ambient light and more focused light, and that there is not. The usually a rented apartment will have kind of in in this case we have fluorescent lights uh, which are quite harsh. Uh, so yeah, I think I had some uh, attraction to lamps. Also in my workplace, we we do sell lamps. I work in furniture and homeware, so one of the things that I deal with is is uh, a lamp that they they manufacture. Yeah. So in this um, exhibition, you have. A set of seven lamps. They really look like they are professionally made. Functional. Yeah, they work. Um, I really like how, although they, I think that they are all like using the same bulb, but 
some of them are more like cold flighting for ambience. Uh, can you share a bit about your des design process? Uh, I think I, I, I hit a stumbling block when I really decided I want to make lamps, but I think I was trying to make lamp shapes for a while. Then uh, it still wasn't uh, an idea that I was happy with, but when I decided, oh, actually the whole lamp is made out of cardboard, then I, I just uh, I started designing the, the lamps very very fast and I really enjoyed the process. Um, I designed them based on uh, functionality and, and form and size and also use of boxes. So I, uh, I knew I wanted lamps that use different kinds of boxes. So you have typically, uh, um, you have the big big box that's rectangular so I have one lamp that's like that you have smaller box that's rectangular you have flat boxes which are your red mud boxes flat and the, the depth is very little um, and then you have the boxes with the lids uh, so I was developing ways to join them um, with as minimal actually to try not to use tape actually um, yeah so once I finish using all of the, having a variation in size and height and also types of boxes, then, then I knew that um, the, the work was kind of half complete. The, the last part was the images. Uh, the presentation also includes this uh, booklet here. Can you talk us through a little bit about this? Um, so the, the drawings inside will kind of mimic the drawings that I drew when planning to make the boxes. Um, actually at work, I, my colleagues do um, AutoCAD drawing, which the, they, they draw products and um, so I do have, I do look at a lot of these product design drawings a lot and wonder whether I can do them myself or so. Um, and I also wanted to make a work that is um, has a life beyond the exhibition. Um, so I'm experimenting now with, with including publications that that are part of the show. Um, so for this this book is it is also released um, online as a PDF for free, uh, even though it's it's not kind of clearly stated because because actually one of the the big influence was a book by Enzo Mari, an uh, Italian um, designer and artist who, who recently passed away. Uh, he had a project called Otto Progrettazioni, which is a set of um, drawings for furniture that can be made very simply with simple materials. And he had the he had the an instruction manual that is freely circulated. So. This project is very much a, a kind of tribute to to that work as well. Yeah. Mm. So do you do you feel that um, in reference to that uh, designer, right? Um, democratizing uh, art or uh, by providing instructions of how to make things. That is quite important to you. Mm. Yeah, I think simplifying art and, and sharing art is quite an important part, uh, which also uh, reflects maybe my, my, my apprehension with, with regard to art education and art school where we kind of professionalize art. Um, but, but I always, uh, all my, my heroes are kind of actually outsider art and, and children art actually, which, which um, so, so my view of art tends to be that is, it can be made by anyone without professional, without um, professional training. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that also relates to sharing uh, art freely and and art becoming part of uh, life and non-art also. Lamps, um, 
functional object. They can they can be um, they can be art and they can be functional objects also. So speaking of long term practice, um, you seem to have like different series that um, I would say um, sustainable in a sense of being um, low stake, easy to do. Um, can you share a little bit about how this is quite important to you? I mean, for example, that there's a series of like taking corners, photographs of corners. Uh, yeah, yeah, they have to be easy to do. Maybe because I realize I have short attention span and and uh, sometimes I can be quite lazy. Uh, and I have problem kind of doing a work that, that takes very long to, to, to be done. Um, they have to be convenient also because I want to be making stuff every day if possible. So that means it has to be convenient. So at work, um, at work I would be thinking about work and then uh, on the bus, I, I try to think about commute, works that I can make while commuting, works that I could make in the army, uh, materials I can collect at my current workplace. Um, and that kind of fits into, very naturally into the concept of the work also, that, that is, it is, starts from somewhere personal also. Mm. Now looking through at this uh, booklet, huh? which is supposed to be building instructions, um, it's actually, other than your short write-up, it's mostly visual. Um, so if someone tries to build your lamp, just looking at the visual, it's not that easy. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we, we discussed it, so I, so I, I made the book with, in very close collaboration with, with Gideon and Jamie from Temporary Press. And they did the drawings actually, um, and the design of the book. We 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 tried. I think we were both quite clear that the the it's not instruction manual in a traditional sense, it's like a dummy guide, where it is it is quite clear. Um, so they they also helped in that they are also quite attuned to um, making experimental books that are not so prescriptive. Um, yeah, so the idea is for it to be. Uh, functional, um, kind of open-ended, and and also visually, we we care more about also visual, the visual language rather than so if if um, instructions don't work out in the visually as a as a book, then in the book then we we would leave it up. Mm. Mm. Also, the nature of cardboard boxes, you there will be different sizes and things like that. So so we didn't pursue accuracy in conveying the instruction. Yeah, and if anything, failure could be interesting as well, right? Mm -hmm. Failure to create. Also, yeah. Oh. yeah, and so it's, I guess it also links to Enzo Mari's original um, drawings, which were, which were, there were no text, but, um, so the first time I saw it, uh, I thought, wow, it's impossible to build it. But then when I started to imagine, um, building it and the questions that I have, they were actually answered slowly um, by looking carefully at the drawing. So like, uh, what angle should this be? Then you actually find the solution within the drawing or where, which angle does the screw enter by? Um, yeah, so, so that was kind of the idea of the, uh, how we mediated the drawing to be functional and yet um, quite abstract at the same time. Let's talk about happiness then. You were sharing with me uh, last week that you felt happy making the work. Yeah, yeah, actually, I thought you, you asked, I mean, actually I dreamt of the, of us doing this talk the night before. Maybe I was a bit stressed about it, but I, I dreamt that you said like, um, is this a set? Or you're asking like very short questions. Huh? Like, are you happy? Um, um, what is it made of? Like you kept doing using short questions, and I really liked it. So so it's strange that you really asked the question about happiness. Uh, most all all my works, I realize 
uh, so I thought about my previous works also. Since I was uh, maybe 17, I was kind of properly making work. Uh, all of them were born out of uh, anger or depression, really. Uh, very directly, actually. Um, but this is the only kind of happy work. <laughs> and, and during a very... Uh, Maybe because it's a difficult time that I thought maybe we sh really we, I shouldn't be making a depressing work. It's not the right time to be commenting about how the um, certain issues in the world. So the, the next show I'm working on is, is going to be again an angry show uh, um, about the environment and, and my anxiety towards global warming. But this one is this one is a is a is a happy work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On your website, your your music link does not really have an overall statement. It's like oh. where you don't yeah, really just care, en right? As in the link just enters the <laughs> Bandcamp page. Yeah. The 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 Bandcamp page is is a is a diary of, of sorts. Uh. Because not not many people will see it. Or listen to it, so the privacy gives you a lot. Of, give me a lot of freedom to rant. So I have very long rants on the description of albums. Um, I don't explain them because I don't take take the because I didn't study music, so I, I'm not very stressed about. It. It's not very professional for me. Yeah. So it's it, yeah. It seems like art and your various uh, formats, right? Books, exhibitions, they are what constitute your professional identity. Uh, whereas music is where you are most free. Right? So art is your profession. <laughs> no, 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 this is more... I, I, don't think it's, I don't think about it so much, really. But, but I do try to split the music when people say like, oh, what does, where does the music come into your art. That, that is something I'm trying to avoid. Um, like, oh, maybe I can make a work that uses my music. I'm trying to avoid that completely. Yeah, this work is, has no music. Mm, yeah, but I always toy with the idea because I think people people talk about it. That's, that's why I think also socializing is quite dangerous for art making. I, I believe in being a, in a cave uh, yeah, for art making. Do you mean like you may be pushed to doing things you don't want? Yeah, yeah, and it's dangerous because it is not your or you are pleasing. You're doing things to please other people. But we we all do. It, yeah, all the every work that I make still has some element of some form of um, guidance or um, pandering to a certain language that will please certain people. Uh, yeah, but these things better not to think about. Yeah, it's a it's a messy it's a it'll throw you into a messy hole of uh, kind of self doubt and questioning, which I avoid now a lot. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. So one one of the things that I am very pleased about, I'm very happy about was uh, I spent a lot of time looking at the text piece in your solo show at uh, the Serangoon Shopping Centre. Yeah, it, I think it was a um, series of stanzas describing what time one wakes up. Yeah, yeah. so ah, so in the past I was writing instruction manuals also. Instruction, I don't know. Oh, I was into instructional art. Then that started my art making practice. Um, doing short instructions. Then I started writing instructions. Then I joined the army, then I was given a lot of instructions. Then I went to school, then also a lot of, given a lot of instructions. Um, then I make this instruction menu. But that, that work is... Uh, uh, at that period, I was writing a lot of short instructions about abstract things. So for this one, it's how to, how to sleep and wake up at the same day. So basically, not to sleep. And the, the idea that I had was that if you stagger your meals, you will it will be impossible for you to to sleep. Like when you're hungry, you eat a 
you eat a full meal. When you're sleepy, you eat a full meal instead of going to sleep. Yeah. Right. So what I sense from, from that instruction is also a kind of um, description of how somebody might be living and existing uh, rather than a kind of top-down or outside-in kind of uh, step-by-step procedure of getting something right. Mm. It's a description, it's a story. Yeah, yeah it sounds like a story of a person. Yeah, yeah, so that at that point of time I couldn't write stories but suddenly I can in the past one year I, uh, I've been writing more f- fiction uh, maybe because in the past I was, was, was criticized for writing uh, stories uh, yeah, or someone said my stories were not good uh, then I was very sad about it uh, I didn't write anymore then recently I could write again. But I guess in the past I was writing that. So I felt comfortable writing in, in instructional language. Um, because I felt my language wasn't, or my imagination wasn't vivid enough for writing fiction. Uh, but nowadays I write some fiction. I'm coming back to this um, series of seven lambs, right? So in terms of material, you have the cardboard and of course the, the lambs and photographs. Do you want to talk a bit about the photographs? Ah, uh, photographs. The the I guess the only tricky part of the title is the word adequate, which is intentionally uh, I, I guess quite awkward as a word. Um, the term comes from uh, a filmmaker called Werner Herzog who spoke in an interview about the need for adequate images to describe our time. So uh, I interpreted it as we are seeing too many unnecessary images and we need kind of adequate, and I was trying to think about what is adequate images for our time. Um, somehow I need, and I ended up with, with, with kind of more personal, meaningful images for myself. Hoping also that the, when you build the lamps, the, the last part is to um, export your phone images and stick them, print them on laser print and use scotch tape and stick them on the lamps. Yeah, so it's really quite, it's a positive work. Right? Yeah. Mm. So the, the, the word adequate here has something to do with uh, the personal, right? That, that is not uh, anxious about pleasing the others, is that right? Mm. Adequate. Yeah, I guess maybe in that sense, um, the personal versus the the commercial, uh, maybe. I think most my problem with images today is that there are too many commercial images telling us uh, what to buy and everything. It does make up the core or the larger body of images that exist today. So what then is necessary images in a time of um, impending end of the world? So, uh, that really reminds me of your solo show at DAC, where you had one line of um, smiley portraits taken from the newspapers. You know, that commercialization, even commodify, commoditization of um, uh, the look of happiness or agreeability. Yeah. Yeah, the, the DAC show is definitely a very angry show uh, against images. Yeah. Is also kind of the end of, uh, or the start of being angry about images for me and telling everyone, like, look, I'm very angry with, <laughs> with the way images of photography is progressing today. Yeah. Maybe, we, maybe to end off here, yeah, I should ask you a, a question that we, that we discussed, um, that I thought was quite important for we discussed last week when we met. Uh, what are our hopes for? Oh, actually, from from my point of view, what do what can you ex, what can a young artist expect from uh, the future? Uh, both, yeah, I guess to be tighter in in arts uh, or doing art long term. Yeah. You ask me. Or I ask, I ask, I'm asking you. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. asked you. Yeah, and then you you had oh, quite a nice. 
answer, yeah. Well, a lot of wait, waiting time. Uh, I think art profession is a little bit like army. Uh, waiting to rush and then rush to wait. Yeah, so I guess be prepared for um, disappointments and very rare, on rare occasion, joys, uh, have feelings of happiness here and there. Um, sorry, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to give hopeful ending. Hopes for the <laughs> hopes for the future. <laughs> <laughs> hopes for the future was tough lah. Um, yeah, I'm not really good in giving hope. Um, but I, I think it's important to be uh, realistic, I guess. Yeah, and you know I'm I'm stuck with this um, content page of your instruction you no know, manual because I think it's it's um, an even better way to end. Um, I mean, the first section uh, has got images, drawings, and text, and then the second section are I suppose they are names of each of the seven lands. Lovely. You, you want to read, read out there? They are quite functional. They, they sound like they are your kids. Jellyfish, firefly, table lamp, spotlight, lantern, lighthouse, and lamppost. Yeah, they are light emitting um, sources. Yeah, I didn't intend for it to sound so cute. Uh, but I couldn't find anything else but jellyfish for, for the first lamp. Yeah. Yeah, quite, maybe quite kiddie. Nice. Okay. Thanks for <laughs> Thank thanks you. for the talk. Yeah. My pleasure.